request, I'll formally welcome all of you again. But can you kindly put your phones on silent or on flight mode, whichever is appropriate, unless you have a medical emergency. I'd urge you not to look at your phones till 20 hundred, that's 8 p.m. Unless of course, any of you are providing live inputs on social media for Dr. Sethi's lecture. But barring that, the other minor request I have is that we'll finish sharp at 8 p.m. It's 6.30 now, so it's 90 minutes. If any of you need to leave, first of all, I hope you don't have to leave before 8 p.m. But if you must, please do it unobtrusively. And let me warn you that the chair has an eagle eye. So you'll have to make sure the chair doesn't see you. But if you must, please sit on that side now. And so that we keep the gravitas and the protocol of the lecture, the talk. And ideally, of course, I would request all of you to stay till 2000. But we will have the first shuffle at about 1920 when Dr. Sethi finishes her remarks in case some of you have to leave. This is just a minor atom. On that note, I'm delighted to see so many of you here this evening in person, many old faces. I can see one, my, I hope it'll, you'll not take offense if I say the usual suspects, but I see a lot of think tankers here and I'm reminded of our days in Sapru House, we were just talking about it about the genesis of many of these issues. So I just want to informally greet all of you and welcome you. Whose phone is that? Caps, nuclear nerds. We have a group here, by the way, called the nuclear nerds. It's in caps and Manpreet is the Sherpa of the nuclear nerds and I'm delighted that all of you are here. But on that note, again, it's half past six. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening to all of you and those who have joined us virtually. Allow me to welcome all of you on behalf of the India International Center and the SPS, the Society for Policy Studies. My name is Uday Bhaskar. And as I said at the outset, we are very glad that all of you are here in person. And I gather from our technical team that we have more than 40 people already who have joined us virtually from different parts of both within India and I don't know about outside, but those of you who are on board from other parts of uh, both India and the rest of the world, welcome. And we are so glad that you're able to join us. Very briefly, the genesis of this series of lectures, I think some of you may recall, we had at the IIC, along with us in the SPS, we have embarked on this a series of security related lectures. And we were planning to do this one every month. And we use the word security really in its most holistic definition, which is really going back to one formulation that we have in India, in the Indian Arthashastra, that at the end of the day, when we talk about security, it is about the well being of the citizen. The Yoga Shema, as the Arthashastra refers to it. And there are so many facets when it comes to security and how the state deals with this concept. Our scope is not as ambitious. We were looking at some discrete hard power elements of security, particularly in the military domain. But we started off with energy security. I'm glad Shabanti is here, right? Yeah, uh, Shabanti Dadwal had launched this with us last month. And today we are looking at the nuclear issue, the nuclear challenges to India's security. And again, just to place the subject in context, you know, ever since the run up to 1945, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the kind of human intervention that created many facets of nuclear power, nuclear potential, both in terms of the cloud that we associate with Hiroshima, Nagasaki, to more recent challenges as we saw in Fukushima. And this year, I think in the Ukraine war, the kind of attack that took place and which was denied and all kinds of opaque interpretations on the reactor there. In between, of course, we had Chernobyl and that whole experience. But the nuclear issue is inversely proportional in terms of the consequences in the event there is a nuclear incident or an accident that goes out of the script. And yet there is a lot of what I would call as deliberate 
an opaque kind of cloud over the nuclear issue across the world, not just in India. And it's some of these aspects that there is a group that has been trying for many years. I used to be a member of the Pugwash in my younger days. We in India had a fairly active kind of community that tried to sensitize at least the local civil society and the powers that be about the nuclear issue. And now I'm very glad that we are able to revisit it in a more holistic way. And Dr. Manpreet Sethi, a colleague from the IDSC, she of course would speak to us about this, but I have great pleasure in welcoming and introducing Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon, who kindly agreed to chair the session. Ambassador Menon is a very busy man. He's just come back from a whistle stop tour of the United States where he was in Harvard, he was in MIT speaking and lecturing. And in between, of course, I literally shanghaied him, if I may use that term, and found a date that suited him. Again, he doesn't need much of an introduction, but while I was going through his profile, it struck me that he has really, I think, one of those distinctive career profiles where he's the only person, and I don't think this is going to happen in a hurry, where we have a former foreign secretary who's also served as the national security advisor, spent many years looking at China from his early days in the foreign service to where he is now as Professor Shiv Shankar Menon at the Ashoka University, teaching there and also heading the China Center at Ashoka. So I couldn't think of a more qualified person. And I want to put this out on social media. I just picked it up saying he's the man who knows too much on China and who also has a very deep water table. So whoever put this out on social media, thank you. I picked it up. I sort of nudged it forward. On that note, Shankar, may I request you, sir, to share the proceedings? And we'll only have to request you to come here because you're on Facebook Live. So it's going all over. Please. Thank you, Udaf, for that introduction. I actually learned something about myself <laughs> in this introduction. It's unusual. Thank you for that. Uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see such a good crowd and a knowledgeable crowd at that which is tribute to the speaker that we have this evening. Dr. Manpreet Sethi is probably the foremost academic, Indian academic on nuclear issues today among us. And it's always been a pleasure to listen to her when she was at the IDSA, now that she's at CAPS. Uh, in, I, you know, as Foreign Secretary NSA, you get a bit stale, jaded. You know, you, you don't normally, you're told you must read this, lots of stuff to read, but, but her stuff I always read. And I normally ended up learning something from it. So I'm looking forward very much to hearing you speak today to us. And the timing is also very good. Uh, if you think of it, the nuclear context within which we as India are operating has changed in many significant ways. Technology has changed. Today, if you look at sensing technology, it's so much more effective that there is a real risk today that uh, countries might be tempted to go in for decapitation strikes for counter force. Uh, so the balance is shifting in the calculus. Uh, you've seen that the non-proliferation regime is fraying around the edges. I mean, Ukraine is only the latest example. What happened to the Budapest Memorandum of 1994? where Russia, the US, UK, and later France, China had joined in, had promised to protect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And here is Russia invading the Ukraine. I mean, in return for which Ukraine gave up her nuclear weapons. So, and you can see the ripple effect. Abe stands up immediately after the invasion in Japan and speaks of Japan needing to consider nuclear weapons. Of course, Kishida immediately tamped that down. But it shows you the effect of what's going on. Clearly, Kim Jong-un is never going to give up weapons. 66% of South Koreans believe that if North Korea has nuclear weapons, they should have it too. In which case, what are you looking at? You're looking at a real prospect of nuclear Russia, nuclear China. This is just in Northeast Asia. Nuclear China, nuclear North, North Korea, nuclear South Korea. Where can Japan go? So, I mean, things are shifting in fundamental ways. Uh, you look at what AUKUS does, China's bastion strategy, 
for her SLBMs immediately comes into question. Why is China suddenly announcing, and this is what's relevant to us directly, you can see huge silo constructions going on in China in at least three sites that the world has publicly identified. You can see what's happening and you can see this attempt by China now to change the basis on which her nuclear relationship with the other two big powers, with in fact, with the two big powers between that and the two. Uh, I think you can see how she's trying to change that by building out not just technical improvements, new, new missile types, Merving, Marving, but more than that, by the way she's deploying them and what she's trying to do. Pakistan case, we've seen her stated policy of relying on tactical nuclear weapons. But more than that, for me, the worry is really personnel reliability in a country where everything that we can see, whether it's the politics, the economy, society, is shaky. How reliable can people be who are in charge of weapons like this? And tactical weapons will be delegated. There's no question. So, so the context around us is shifting fundamentally. And for each, each of these poses its own challenges to us, to our own nuclear posture, to our doctrine. And I hope she has all the answers to give us. <laughs> so now please come and tell us what we should do as India. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, sir. Uh, those were rather generous words, and I don't think I deserve them. Uh, it's your rich experience, sir, your deep insights, uh, balanced uh, views, uh, and the wisdom that I have learned a lot from. And having uh, Ambassador Shamsaran here is really uh, the cherry on the icing, sir. Thank you for being here. And thanks to each one of you to have braved the Delhi heat uh, and a Friday evening to spend thinking about nuclear issues. Uh, so really grateful for your presence here and I hope uh, it'll be worth your while. So uh, uh, Commodore Bhaskar, I can't start without uh, thanking you for putting this together. It was, I think 25 years ago, sir, that our association started at IDSA. I remember it was in July, 1997 when I joined uh, the Institute. Uh, and I uh, and India then tested nuclear weapons. In fact, today is the 13th of May, uh, which is the second round of tests that we did in 1998. And India then declared itself as a state with nuclear weapons. And uh, since I had joined IDSA about a year before that, uh, it was really learning at the feet of Commodore Bhaskar, Commodore Jasjit Singh and K. Subramaniam, um, understanding the nuclear issues, the global picture and what India uh, needed the weapons for and how we were going to find our way uh, in this entire process. So it's been a wonderful journey uh, trying to understand many of these nuclear issues. And really, um, as I have read more and understood the issues more, uh, hopefully, uh, I have found I know less and less about the subject. So I've often found when people start looking at the nuclear issue, they feel they figured it out and, you know, everything is clear and uh, this is how it needs to be. But the more you learn, you realize the less you know. Uh, of the whole thing, because there are so many wheels within wheels and everything is rather counterintuitive at times. Uh, so a lot of unlearning is needed, uh, particularly from the conventional domain. And since at the Center for Air Power Studies, we deal a lot with the uh, uniformed uh, you know, community, uh, getting them to understand the nuclear picture is different from what conventional warfighting is all about, has been quite a struggle. Uh, and we are trying to you know, do our best there. So today my, uh, evening, uh, I'm looking at three, largely three nuclear challenges. Yeah, so since we are looking at what are the nuclear challenges to India's security, one can frame them in many ways. What I've decided to do is to look at them from the prism of the nuclear China and what that poses the kind of uh, problem that that poses for us, and then nuclear Pakistan. I've listed nuclear terrorism here, but uh, given the paucity of time, I'm not going to spend much time on nuclear terrorism. In case there are questions on that, we can, of course, you know, dwell on it a little bit. But essentially, nuclear China and nuclear Pakistan and the, the nature of the challenge that they pose is what I'm going to be essentially looking at.
So to unpack the India-China nuclear dyad first, and here, uh, I think those of you who follow the subject know uh, China went nuclear in 1964. 16th of October 1964 is when they tested their nuclear weapons and Premier Mao had then spelt out what was the, going to be the nature of arsenal buildup, the kind of deployment, posture, etc. that they were going to take. And uh, from then to now, uh, at the official level, uh, the doctrine of China has remained essentially the same. It started coming out in a written format, a couple of paragraphs in their white papers on national defense that started coming out in 1998. And every white paper since then has mentioned what is the nuclear doctrine of China from then to now. But what is interesting is some of the recent developments that have been taking place in this nuclear China. While they were looking at nuclear deterrence, largely from the, from the prism of opacity in the past, where they won't talk so much about their nuclear capability, they won't draw attention to their nuclear weapons at all, we find today the nuclear capability is on display. They're no longer hiding anything about it. It's no longer opaque. There's a relative transparency. Uh, and they're letting you see what they want you to see about the nuclear capability of China. Xi's thought and ideology, Xi Jinping's thought and ideology here is to build a strong nation with a strong military. In many of his speeches, this is the language that he's been using, strong enough to shape the global order as per national interest. That is the focus of the country. They are very clear about where they want to go. And they, the need for a strong military to take them there is quite central to that thinking. And within this then, there is a greater emphasis on nuclear capabilities. As I said, in the past, they were very silent about it. Today, they're no longer shy about talking about their nuclear capabilities, both for the purpose of deterrence and for status as a major power. The understanding that to be a major power, the parity which is needed with the US on the economic front, but parity also on the nuclear front is what they feel is necessary for them to be able to stand head to head, talk uh, with the US on these issues. And within this context, many activities of the Chinese are taking place. One of which I've mentioned here, which is the elevation of the PLA rocket forces to the same level as the other three services. And they have been, publicizing their joint exercises of the PLARF with the others, the PLA Strategic Support Force, uh, contributing to these joint exercises to show that they will be able to fight a nuclear war if necessary. Now, if you look at the capability trajectory, and there are three parameters, three criteria on which I'm going to be assessing their capability trajectory, one of which is warhead numbers. Now, Mao, when they had tested the nuclear weapon, and then his enemy was both the US and the USSR. And he had at, then, at that time made a statement to say, all we need are six nuclear weapons. The whole concept was that a small arsenal suffices for the purpose of nuclear deterrence. And I think a lot of the lessons they learned from the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, where the US showed they had no stomach for taking any kind of a nuclear uh, exchange with their adversary. So the Chinese learned that you don't need a large arsenal to deter. And they went with that concept of a small arsenal for up to now. I would say it's only in the last five years that the focus has shifted to increase in numbers. Uh, if you look at you know, the American estimates, uh, the DOD reports, the Department of Defense reports that come out uh, uh, very regularly, and I've been following them from 2000 onwards. Every year, the DOD would say that the Chinese nuclear arsenal is going to grow, go up to 1,500 nuclear warheads, and it never happened. So the Chinese belied those estimates of stockpile increase, and I think the Americans were coming to that, mirror imaging their own strategy and believing that if a country has the capability, you need a large stockpile to be able to deter. But the Chinese said, no, we will be able to deter with a small arsenal. And the numbers remain largely stagnant for a long, long period of time. Uh, we all remember we've been looking at it 250, 260. That's the kind of numbers we used to talk about. But in recent times, if you look at what the CIPRI report was that came out only uh, last year, it put the number at 350. Uh, and the previous year in 2020, it was 320. So 30 warheads in one year, which made it the fastest growing nuclear arsenal actually uh, of any country which is uh, developing nuclear weapons or still manufacturing nuclear weapons producing. 
uh, they have also started moving. Uh, the numbers are increasing because they are moving to MIRVED missiles, where one missile is able to carry multiple independently retargetable vehicles. So therefore, uh, uh, the numbers are increasing as the warhead numbers are increasing because one missile is now able to carry more warheads. They are building new silos, as the chair mentioned. Uh, three of those sites have been sort of uh, come to light. Uh, and the estimate now is that the numbers will double from 350 to 700 by 2027 and even go up to 1000 by 2030. Uh, and today's China looks the, capable of uh, you know, actually going in that direction. The second dimension on which you judge their trajectory is the delivery systems. And here I find uh, land-based missiles of varied ranges, which have been tested and uh, come into deployment. They have moved from liquid fuel to solid fueled missiles to make them you know, uh, available faster for any deployments. Uh, road and rail mobility is what they have invested in. Elaborate network of tunnels and hardened silos, uh, as I just mentioned. So uh, survivability dimensions of their arsenal is what they have been focused on in terms of the delivery systems and dispersal of the missiles across the triad. So whether it's land-based air delivery with the new aircrafts, modernized aircrafts that they now have, uh, the H6A, uh, so those are available and the sea-based platforms. So moving on from the Shin class, to the Shia class, to the Jin class now, uh, with longer range missiles, submarine launched ballistic missiles available on those platforms. So you see developments happening across the triad uh, in this. And the third dimension where I'm looking at this is from the BMD dimension, the countermeasures that they have been building to the ballistic missile defense of the US. Considering that for China, the US BMD is a major concern. They feel that deterrence for them could be undercut uh, and particularly if they stick to a small arsenal, then their ability to cause unacceptable damage. Because if the US is able to protect itself, uh, then the amount that will be needed uh, by the Chinese to be able to cause that damage to them uh, is going to be large. So looking at the BMD of the US, they have been working on certain countermeasures against that. Here we find penetrability of their missiles improving. So MERV missiles, MARVED missiles, which are maneuverable re-entry vehicles, and the hypersonic delivery systems, which have been much in news in recent times, the kinds of testing that they have shown with their hypersonic systems. And interestingly, while the Americans say their hypersonic missiles are going to be conventionally armed, the Russian avant-garde missiles, the hypersonics are going to be nuclear armed. The Chinese, like they like to always keep everything ambiguous, say it could be dual use. So it could be both conventional and nuclear. Uh, and essentially, this is to counter the US missile defense. Also, better accuracy of their delivery systems. So if earlier they were satisfied with less accurate missiles, now for both their conventional and their nuclear delivery, we see them going towards better accuracy. And uh, their space-based capabilities, which have improved in recent times, have certainly uh, given them that ability to get to more accurate systems. So why is China growing numbers and the capability? And I, I mean, uh, the Chinese have never corroborated anything about numbers or said that they are imp uh, increasing it, but going by certain intelligent guesstimates as to what they are doing and why they are doing it. Firstly, of course, are the deterrence concerns. And I mentioned to you both the US BMD, as well as what the Americans call the conventional global prompt strike which is to say that their strategic delivery systems with conventional weapons. You know, earlier the Americans had this distinction between their conventional and their nuclear. But to get to terrorist targets, they started talking about using their strategic delivery systems, which were only for nuclear, with also conventional warheads. And the Chinese then have been worried that these systems could uh, conventionally take out their nuclear capability. And therefore, in order to counter that, we find that their numbers and the kind of capability that I've just mentioned to you, including penetrability, is what they're looking at. So silos uh, also to play the shell game, which is where you build these silos. Uh, the adversary knows that you have these silos, but he doesn't know whether each of those silos is actually populated with a missile or not. 
So he would end up losing much more in trying to attack those silos, believing that there could be uh, systems there. So while sensing technology is going to be a concern, sir, uh, people are also finding ways of how you're going to get around that problem uh, uh, in, in trying to maintain survivability and not uh, face the prospect of a decapitating strike. The second reason is political, uh, where the idea is to deter any challenge to core interests, and China is more and more vocal about what are its core interests. Great power status, which comes only through parity. I find a lot of Chinese scholars talking in this language about the need for parity. And, and uh, what I've put in inverted commas here is what they have said, that we want to earn mutual vulnerability through uh, a mutual assured destruction the way the US had with the USSR and, and later with Russia. Also, these increased numbers mean having chips for future arms control, because the US is so keen to get into some kind of strategic stability, arms control arrangements with China, then uh, developing these larger capabilities will help them uh, when any arms control is uh, coming into being. Lastly, of course, they have the availability of surplus resources. So whether it's the financial wherewithal uh, or it is the fissile material, they've got both of them to be able to add to the arsenal and the stockpile that they have. Now, as a result of what is going on in China, there are two challenges uh, that are essentially being created. There are two changes in how they are establishing their deterrence. And this is what matters to us. One is the nuclear posture is creating more and more ambiguity. You know, earlier, if it was opacity, now with that relative transparency that they are bringing in, they're also bringing in a certain amount of ambiguity into their strategy. So commingling of nuclear and conventional missiles, including of their command and control systems. We have the PLA rocket force, which is the custodian of all missiles. Some missile bases have both kinds of systems. Some missiles are dual use. Uh, and also they have shown in salvo launches, they are able to switch from conventional to nuclear. And this has been publicized in order to you know, establish that kind of a, a deterrence vis-a-vis um, -vis the US. The second posture change that is happening is creating risks. Uh, stronger Chinese military capability and assortive, assertive posture will alter US behavior towards China. This is the understanding with which they are approaching this idea of creating risks. Therefore, the need to signal the ability to fight and manage nuclear escalation, particularly in contingencies like the South China Sea and Taiwan, where they feel that the stakes for them are always going to be much more than it is going to be for the US. So therefore, for them to take a chance with the kind of risks that have been created with China's nuclear posture is what they're banking on will be able to deter the US from acting here. Lowering the alert levels to launch on warning and launch under attack. Uh, risk creation, again, for better deterrence. From what is known in the public domain, the Chinese up to now have been keeping their uh, missiles demated. Uh, they are not in a hair trigger posture, uh, but now they seem to be moving uh, towards that direction. So as a result of this, then, what happens to no first use? Because the Chinese have been stood steadfast on the idea of no first use. With the kind of capability buildup and ambiguity, uh, risk creation, what then happens to no first use? Now, the challenge here for India is a greater confidence in military capability enables a more assertive China. And we've seen that. You know, this is uh, an, a Chinese official who said being a great power means you get to do what you want and no one can say anything about it. So getting away with what they want to get and the behavior at the line of actual control for India, uh, the you know contested uh, boundaries, as well as their behavior in other institutions vis-a-vis -vis India. All of that is showing that sense of confidence that they have. Lastly, what are India's options then on handling a China of this nature? And while there are no clear answers, I'm going to suggest to you what is in my understanding at the nuclear challenge level, uh, what we need to do. Some people have suggested we need to change from no first use to first use to be able to deter, deter China better. And uh, I don't agree with that uh, because I feel uh, a no first use strategy is still giving you the space to be able to fight conventionally uh, with any country, whether it's China or Pakistan. Moving to a first use strategy is actually leading to baiting with the use of nuclear weapons. And that certainly is not in India's interest. Secondly, if you want to move towards a first use strategy, it's not about just dropping no from you know, no first use. It's about building a credible arsenal 
and the kind of arsenal requirements of a credible first use strategy uh, are quite expensive and quite elaborate. So if we move in that direction, we have to think seriously about it because just saying that you are going to be first use against China without building the necessary arsenal and the command and control systems which will be needed for that first use is not going to be something that will deter China easily. After all, do we believe Pakistan's first use uh, when they seem to suggest that to us? The second approach that some people have suggested is deploy tactical nuclear weapons, that we need to develop our own TNWs. People have mentioned things like nuclear landmines and have them planted at border areas. And that will be one way of deterring the Chinese. Now, again, I find this rather problematic. Uh, the use of any nuclear weapon has to be seen as a strategic act. You can call it a tactical nuclear weapon, which India doesn't believe in. I remember Ambassador Shamsaran's, uh, you know, as the NSAB chair, when he made that statement that India doesn't believe in the concept of tactical nuclear weapons. There is nothing tactical about the use of a nuclear weapon. The impact will be strategic and India should not fall into the trap of believing that getting into the TNW game is ever going to be of any benefit uh, militarily for us. Rather, it would magnify the risk of inadvertent nuclear war. If at the border and there was there were some Chinese troops that were blown up as a result of the TNWs that we planted there, would that be seen as first use by the Chinese? And would there be retaliation as a result of that? What about the Indians who are in those border areas who could step on these landmines and what kind of a problem would that be? So nuclear weapons are not like conventional weapons and they must be, I think, treated quite differently. So why create these risks for ourselves? We must be very careful about the kind of nuclear risks that we want to create for the sake of enhancing deterrence and those that are going to hit back at us in some form or the other. I think the China challenge needs to be met with dime actions, diplomatic, information, military, and economic. And within this, focus on the usable Military instruments is where we have to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing our capability build up. We should avoid being sucked into any kinds of a nuclear arms race, particularly a nuclear arms race, uh, and rather focus on the credibility of a survivable arsenal to signal our deterrence. And we can talk about what those uh, aspects of survivability that we need to focus on. India is a big country. We've got a huge landmass. We've got uh, a good naval capability. So there is a way in which we can build up that survivability and signal the credibility of our deterrence at the nuclear level and build uh, and work on all of the dime aspects in order to uh, deter China. Now, India Park nuclear dyad. And I think here I need to spend much less time. Everyone understands what Pakistan's nuclear strategy is. The role of their nuclear weapons is to act as a shield against India's conventional response while they carry on with their acts of terrorism. So to bleed India through a thousand cuts with a low cost strategy that they have with cross-border terrorism, but stop India from responding to that by suggesting that you know, the, any kind of a response from India will escalate up to the nuclear level very quickly. So it's a deliberate projection of uncertain behavior uh, by the Pakistanis, brinksmanship that they like to exercise through uncertainty and projected irrationality. They're doing it rather rationally, but projecting an irrationality about the use of weapons. You know, when President Putin started making all these nuclear noises and the West was much concerned about what it is, they had forgotten that, you know, India lives with this, with this every time there is a crisis. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of how the, uh, you need to be able to fight a conventional war in nuclear shadow is something they need to learn from us now. Uh, after all the nuclear learning that they did for Indian uh, scholars and practitioners by suggesting to them learn from the Cold War experience. But I think uh, after all the noise that they made about how South Asia is the nuclear flashpoint, look where the actual flashpoint actually cropped up. But this is essentially what is Pakistan's nuclear strategy, and they like to articulate rather vague red lines in order to suggest that escalation can happen very quickly. They play up this nuclear shadow uh, as part of their risk maximizing strategy to deter India, as well as to play on the Western fears. The whole thing about the flashpoint being in South Asia. Uh, and this risk of escalation then is meant to deter. They have no interest in crisis 
stability, measures that would take you towards crisis stability. Because if you were to establish stability at the nuclear level with India, then Pakistan doesn't get to do its acts of you know, subconventional uh, terrorism uh, and, and uh, escape any kind of an Indian response. So their idea of TNWs, um, dual use crews and sea-based missiles, everything is meant to increase instability. This is rather different from what we saw in the Cold War, where the two superpowers were looking at establishing strategic stability. But here you've got a country which is not interested in strategic stability because then it defeats the purpose for which it actually acquired its nuclear weapons. So the challenge then for India from this kind of a strategy is how do you deter terrorism? It's not the nuclear weapons of uh, Pakistan, which is a problem. It's the acts of terrorism that it continues with. How do you punish Pakistani behavior? How do you execute conventional operations to make Pakistan's nuclear weapons redundant? After every crisis, if you remember, the prime minister of Pakistan, whoever that is, likes to push the you know, nuclear uh, weapons under your nose to say, don't mess with us. We are a nuclear weapon state. But for India, the important thing is that those nuclear weapons don't matter when we need to punish them, when we need to carry out any kind of a retaliatory resp response to it, that those nuclear weapons will not uh, interfere with our strategy. So how do you obviate the risk then of nuclear escalation? And the answer then is conventional operations in nuclear shadow to be able to find that space and to use it intelligently uh, to undertake conventional punitive action. 1971 is no longer conceivable. That kind of a war is not something that India can do. In fact, even when we saw Op Parakram, where you, know, you had this large scale mobilization, you were standing there for one year, not able to achieve the political objectives because the presence of nuclear weapons does cast a shadow. So unless we recognize that, we will not be able to find the right way of finding those responses against Pakistan. So uh, surgical and airstrikes, what we have shown in 2016 and 2019, are some of the ways in which you can do calibrated, controlled use of force. And it will have to be done repeatedly. There's not ever going to be one answer for the acts of terrorism. So it will have to be a long haul, repeated exercises. And every time finding the instruments that are capable of quick escalation and quick de-escalation. And therefore, the large scale military operations, I think, is uh, pretty much out of the picture. Here I find India's nuclear doctrine of NFU actually enables us this space. You know, when people suggest that we should move to first use in order to deter Pakistan, I don't think we need to do that because what NFU is doing is giving you that space by letting the adversary not be on the edge and uh, uh, fight a conventional war. So how is it doing that? By leaving the onus of escalation on the adversary. And this is where I said sometimes on nuclear strategy, things are counterintuitive. Uh, in conventional domain, you want to keep the element of surprise and initiative with yourself. But in the nuclear domain, it's better to leave the onus of escalation on the adversary because this then liberates the adversary from the fear of use or lose. And therefore, his temptation to come early to the level of nuclear escalation uh, comes down. Meanwhile, you're also liberating your own self from the weight of first use. And for any political leader who has to take that call about the use of nuclear weapons, there is a certain weight that he'll be carrying on his uh, shoulders. When, how early or late are you going to use nuclear weapons? What are your red lines? With India's NFU, the only red line is use of nuclear weapons. So we don't have to articulate those artificial red lines to suggest this is when uh, the weapons will come into play. What India is suggesting with NFU is massive retaliation for any kind of a nuclear use. And as I said, no distinction between low yield or high yield or where the, uh, the weapon actually uh, is used. The military logic of no first use, which is often not understood because generally the belief is there is a political value of a nuclear weapon. It's the ethically the correct strategy to follow. It's uh, you know morally correct to suggest no first use. But there's a military logic of no first use, which isn't adequately understood because when the adversary has a secure second strike capability, and in the case of India, both China and Pakistan have secure second strike capabilities, which means that you will not be able to do with your first strike, however splendid that first strike might be, a decapitating or a, a disarming strike. So retaliation is going to be certainly coming back at you. And in that kind of a picture then, when there is no guarantee against escalation, how does 
one uh, keep that war limited to small numbers uh, or only to the tactical level. I had written an article some years ago which said nuclear weapons like potato chips, no one can use but one. So once you're entered the game of using nuclear weapons, it's going to escalate to higher levels and therefore nuclear offense or first use with nuclear weapons cannot assure protection for a country. What is protecting the country is deterrence. The idea that the weapon should not be used uh, and you're stopping the adversary from using that. So deterrence, not use, is what is actually securing the nation. And India is deterring by signaling massive retaliation. Now, again, on massive retaliation, a lot of questions have been raised, whether that's a good idea or not. In our 2003 document, uh, what is known as uh, the uh, India's nuclear doctrine, it mentions that response to a first strike will be massive. And the question which has often come up is, in response to Pakistan's tactical nuclear weapon, would India be able to do a massive retaliation? Now, my understanding of massive retaliation is coming from the role of nuclear weapons and the nature of nuclear weapons. The nature is such that its damage cannot be controlled in time and space. And therefore, in whatever manner you're using that, and if there is going to be exchange as a result of that, then uh, this is a weapon which can only be suitable for punishment, not for denial, not for denying an objective to the other side, but for suggesting that don't use it because there's going to be punishment, that there's going to be unacceptable damage that will come to you, which will negate whatever objective you're trying to get to with the first use. So this threat of punishment then is by maximizing the fear of disproportionate response. In any case, when you sit down to think about it, what is proportionate response in the case of nuclear weapons? How does one calculate what is proportionate? Is it about the numbers that one side has used and the other is responding with? Is it about the yield? Is it about the damage which is caused right then the number of people who vaporize or is it about the long-term damage uh, which is uh, going to be felt uh, by the communities so uh, the deterrence by the idea of disproportionate response i think makes sense uh, and that's what india is suggesting in any case massive need not be all that we have you know let's not become prisoners of the english language term massive which means everything uh, it is not about the numbers. It's about the damage that we are causing, which is going to be massive. And that's not so difficult given the nature of the nuclear weapon and the density of populations that we are looking at. In fact, the whole distinction between counter force and counter value in the case of India, China, Pakistan is quite artificial uh, because you will end up uh, creating massive damage. So India is then deterring by suggesting we don't believe in small, clean, tactical nuclear weapons any nuclear use will lead to a dirty, messy situation. Now make your decision, Mr. Adversary, whether you want to uh, you know, use whatever you think is a tactical nuclear weapons. My last two slides now. Have nuclear weapons brought us security? 24 years down the line, after having built up this capability, often the question which is raised is, we are still facing uh, the threat of terrorism from Pakistan. And China has only become more aggressive. Uh, we see their incursions at the LSE. So what have nuclear weapons done for our security then? And the answer to this, whether they have brought us security or not, could be yes or no. It depends on how you understand the role of the weapon. As far as India is concerned, it's given itself a rather narrow role of the nuclear weapon to suggest that nuclear weapons are only for deterring nuclear weapons of the other side. They are not meant to counter um, terrorism from Pakistan or conventional asymmetry with China. It is only to safeguard ourselves against the threat of nuclear blackmail or coercion that India built its nuclear capability. So the next question then is, why does India not give these roles to its nuclear weapons? Why don't we start suggesting that these are what nuclear weapons are for? And the answer then to that is, because there are limitations of the credibility when nuclear weapons are given this role. If you start suggesting that any act of terrorism which is carried out against India is going to be responded to by the presence, by the use of nuclear weapons, does that make sense? Would you, and especially when you're looking at an adversary, which is a secure second strike adversary. So then what have you, for an act of terrorism, which has been carried out against your country, and you have responded with the use of nuclear weapons against them, 
and got back nuclear retaliation in return, how have you improved your situation in any form? So the reason why India has the understanding that nuclear weapons are meant only for this narrow role is because of the nature of this weapon. This weapon is not meant for certain kinds of activities and it works best for certain kinds of threat perceptions. The nature of the nuclear weapon is a weapon of mass destruction. And that's why I keep saying it's in a different category altogether. It's not a conventional weapon. It's futile for war fighting. It's good for deterrence. And we've seen that in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. President Putin has been making all kinds of noises with his nuclear weapons. He's raised alert levels. He suggested uh, the use. But I think this episode has also shown the lack of military utility of this weapon. You might use it politically for deterrence, but your ability to find the right theater, the right target, where you will be able to use it militarily and come out better after having used it. Even in the case of Ukraine, which is a non-nuclear country, if Russia was to use it and annex that radioactive uh, you know, territory that it has created, what has it gained in the entire process? Hiroshima and Nagasaki have faded from human memory. And these were just 15 kilotons and 20 kiloton weapons that were used. And look at the kind of damage that they caused, scarred human mind from then to now to say, these are not ordinary weapons that should be used. And the more we talk about them in the ordinary sense, that's where I think the danger lies. And sometimes, you know, with the US itself creates these problems. Its last nuclear posture review, which talked about the idea of limited war fighting with nuclear weapons, uh, Russia's strategy of escalate to de-escalate, all of this is then picked up by our adversaries. So China has co-opted a lot of the thinking of the Americans. And Pakistanis, of course, I remember when um, uh, you know, when this whole idea of limited war fighting came out with the US NPR, the Twitter in Pakistan was a buzz about how they already knew this is how nuclear weapons are, have to be used. So what I, I mean that they were on the right track uh, with that thinking. Uh, so as I, I'm suggesting, they are futile for war fighting. There can never be a political objective that will be worth the cost of inflicting that kind of an injury on the other and taking back the same injury on yourself. Other threats that I've just listed out from both nuclear China and nuclear Pakistan, they do use their nuclear weapons to heckle us, but those threats have to be catered for through other instruments. So my final thoughts then are overburdening nuclear weapons with tasks that they cannot perform will make them less credible. So if we start talking about using them against terror incidents or against LAC incursions, that's not going to be a credible strategy to support with nuclear weapons. Overspending on nuclear weapons will have opportunity costs because what you need are usable, credible military instruments. You do need the hardware at the nuclear level, but understanding what that amount needs to be uh, has to be a careful study of both the adversary as well as your own understanding of what is unacceptable damage for the adversary. So your numbers have to be based on a certain criteria. We need to remember and to remind others that the basics of nuclear deterrence should not be forgotten. And that showed us that the basics of nuclear deterrence don't need a very large arsenal, that the nuclear weapon is, uh, is, is credible only for certain kinds of threats. And the consequences of deterrence breakdown, I think, should also not be forgotten. Unfortunately, in our part of the world, we have not talked much about what the consequences of deterrence breakdown would be. Uh, I don't know at the government level what kind of briefings are given, uh, but I would say recalling them in popular imagination with the movies like The Day After, or uh, you know, there's a BBC uh, documentary called The Threads, which shows you what would be the economic, environmental, social, political impact of the use of a nuclear weapon. That itself would go to strengthen deterrence by letting, and if we were to have, say, joint movie making or joint studies with our adversaries, even in think tanks, uh, it would go to establish deterrence and get them to understand what uh, these issues are all about. It's in our interest to not let the nuclear weapons be conventionalized. My biggest worry out of the Russia-Ukraine conflict is if there was a small use of a nuclear weapon by uh, the Russians and there was no response to that, we would see a situation where nuclear weapons become conventionalized. That would be the worst scenario for us because our adversaries will learn lessons from that and then be in, in big trouble. So this is where I'll stop now and I'm uh, looking forward to 
the discussion that we can have on the subject. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that really presentation. I, but I'm sure with an audience like this, we still have questions. So, floor's open. Uh, first hand up, Sashi from Bashir. Please introduce yourself to the record. Tell us who you are. Thank you, Chair. My name is Bashir. I'm from CSDR. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sethi, for your comments. I always admire your clarity in the subject. Uh, Ma'am, my question pertains to the 1999 Labo MOU. And I think several experts on this side, including you, and on the other side as well, I think people such as uh, Brigadier Firoz Khan, several people have looked at that document as a base document for subsequent, subsequent agreements. And I think several clauses from that uh, agreement have triggered other agreements, such as the pre notification for flight testing, which everybody is talking about in recent time as well. But if you look at the first clause of the document, it talks about India and Pakistan talking to each other on nuclear doctrine. But given how differently Pakistan views concepts such as risk manipulation and deterrence and points that you also have pointed out, but can India and Pakistan talk doctrine? How, have you, how, how do you think that has progressed, that clause, and how it's been operationalized across the past 20, 24 years? So the Lahore Memorandum of Understanding, I think in all our understanding was a uh, was a great um, document uh, coming so soon after both countries had tested their nuclear weapons and at a time when the international community was very angry with India and Pakistan for having blown that hole on non-proliferation. Here were these two countries which were saying we are responsible. It was a very forward-looking document, as you know, and it was putting down several steps that would be taken to get the two countries to uh, establish some kind of a strategic stability. But before that document could go anywhere in terms of implementation, uh, Kargil happened. So February, we signed the document, and in April, May, uh, we find these Pakistani regulars as Mujahideen in our own territory. And that really put paid to where the document could have gone. But... Uh, uh, since then, we have been, uh, you know, talking about why the need for that dialogue on doctrine is important is for both sides to understand and to reduce any chances of misperception. In any case, adversaries are always thinking the worst of each other. So when they are making, when they start talking about full spectrum deterrence as their now uh, their nuclear doctrine, what does it mean in terms of capability buildup? Where will that stop? What are they thinking about the kind of deployment and other postures you know again when they talk about tactical nuclear weapons and then they say we will have tactical nuclear weapons uh, but we will have centralized command and control for those tactical nuclear weapons so then are they really tactical nuclear weapons without the delegated command and control so these are some of the issues on which clarity can come when you have these kinds of dialogue but the political relationship between india and pakistan has been such that we haven't gotten anywhere on any of this. We have some of the best CBMs, uh, you know, or nuclear CBMs with this memorandum, uh, but yet look at the state of our relationship. Uh, and that really is the worrisome aspect. I think it's only at the track two level where some of the academic scholars have been talking about what that doctrine is. Uh, but unfortunately at the track one level, I don't think we've gotten anywhere in any kind of a strategic dialogue with the Pakistanis. That's going to be some distance away once the political relationship stabilizes. But given the kind of risks that both of us exist with, and I'm really not worried about deliberate nuclear use uh, from Pakistan. It's the inadvertent escalation that can happen because of misperceptions, because when we are in a crisis and you start deploying or raising alert levels, then the kind of risks that come in, that is really the matter of concern. And therefore, the need for some kind of communication dialogues, you know, like US and USSR, despite being in the lowest of their political relationships, still manage to keep some dialogue at the nuclear level going. Can we have similar things which are insulated from the political relationship because it's in our interest to be able to have that dialogue? But still an open-ended question. I think part of the problem, I mean, there was an attempt by the in 2005, four, five, six, you know, when the composite dialogue was resumed to get the experts from both sides to actually talk to each other. 
you know, in 99, both sides wanted to establish their, cred their credibility in front of the world as responsible, responsible powers. And, but the real problem, I think we found even when there was a relationship which allowed a dialogue in 2004, 5, 6, was that what she mentioned earlier, that Pakistan has a vested interest in instability. She doesn't have an interest in building stability into the nuclear relationship. And as long as her strategy is based on that, frankly, what the Lahore Memorandum provides for is unlikely to be successfully done uh, in today's circumstances, at least at some point. Sorry, please. I'm Samarad Khosh, and this is like, no, it's okay. Maybe it's better for the record. The recording is I'm Samrat Ghosh, I'm a scientist and an innovator with an interest in conventional and nuclear weapons. So it's a very interesting three-part talk. Uh, but my two related questions uh, concern the first part regarding China. So my first question is because you mentioned that even though China has developed an impressive uh, deterrence capability, but it is still concerned about its survivability. I wanted to know from an expert like you, has China embarked upon something like Ronald Reagan's Star Wars-like nuclear shield program? Because now China has made a lot of progress in science and technology, also working on direct energy weapons, and has, as you said, space-based programs, space-based satellites and all. So anything in, in that direction? And my second question is, now that you said that China is also publicizing its nuclear program, uh, has China also mentioned about its any undersea or underground nuclear risks? Thank you, sir, for both those questions. And uh, China is certainly working on its own ballistic missile defense capability. They are not looking at it from the Star Wars dimension of putting an astrodome kind of a thing on China. They also understand that's going to be uh, technically as well as financially extremely uh, difficult. Uh, but certainly BMD as part of their nuclear strategy is something that they are working on. Uh, air defense, certainly they are very, very keen on. And uh, like us, S-400 has also been bought by the Chinese, as you know, from the Russians. Uh, but they're looking also at ballistic missile defense besides penetrability. So in the case of China, actually, you see both building that defense as well as being able to defeat someone else's defense is where they have uh, they are putting their technology and their money into. Directed energy weapons, yes, they're working on that. And of course, space-based capability has grown by leaps and bounds from uh, you know, what it used to be. So they started off by thinking that what they were hitting out is going to be the American vulnerability in space. But... The good thing for India is they are also building their own vulnerabilities into space now. And with the kind of ASAT tests that they and India have shown, I think uh, there is an inbuilt deterrence to some of that capability which is coming up. On the undersea, yes, as I mentioned to you, they are putting their nuclear delivery systems on all the three legs of the triad. Uh, so unlike, for instance, the UK, which looks at only one leg of the triad, or the French, who are looking at only two legs of the triad, which is air and sea, uh, the Chinese believe that they need to have all three legs of the triad, and therefore they have uh, invested quite a lot over the years. And their, uh, uh, you know, sea-based deterrence program has been going on for um, from the 1980s onwards. Uh, they started off with the first generation of their SSBNs, which was the Shin class, Shia class, and uh, have now moved on to the second generation. They have about, I think, five or six of them, uh, which... Uh, uh, the Shia class never went for any deterrent patrolling, but the Jin class, they have now said, is doing deterrent patrolling. They've got very long-range SLBMs on them, something like 13,000 kilometers. Uh, and of course, the term of reference for them is the U.S. Uh, so it's to be able to deter the U.S., to signal to them credibility of their own deterrence is where they are putting their focus on. But I just wanted to know, like, we don't do any more nuclear testing. Mm -hmm. uh, do they carry out nuclear tests? No, they have done 45 tests in all, and they stopped their testing program in 1996, uh, and they haven't done any more testing thereafter. Uh, many people also ask this question about why they could, you know, why the Americans did thousands of nuclear tests and the Chinese did 45, and we are satisfied with only five uh, nuclear tests. So the reason for that is, um, 
the, one, of course, the political climate is different. We are no longer in an age where you can do nuclear testing and get away uh, with that nuclear testing every now and then. It's only the North Koreans who've been able to you know, do that. Uh, the last test they did was 10, 2017. And the, right now it's in the air that the North Koreans might be uh, preparing themselves for another nuclear test. But then that's a country under sanctions, all, all kinds of uh, you know, uh, other issues there. Uh, but uh, with the advances that have been made with computer simulation today, uh, unless, and I've heard this from people who were part of the nuclear testing program of India, unless you want to change your material in any form uh, for you know, yield up and down, it's very possible to do it uh, with the amount of data collection that you've managed to do with the five nuclear tests. So it's not essential for India for the purpose of deterrence to do more testing. Uh, it might be desirable, but it's given the kind of political context that we are in, uh, we are okay for our deterrence purposes with the kind of tests that we did. Uh, before I come to you in the audience, we have one online question from Harshit Paranspe. Should India have to use limited nuclear conflict to deter Chinese border transgressions? <laughs> Well, in theory, you can always use your nuclear weapons. The whole point about using it is that you should be able to come out looking better after having used that. And if you were to do it at the, uh, at the border uh, in order to stop those transgressions, you are getting into the larger nuclear game. Uh, once you have used the nuclear capability, how do you guarantee that the other side is also believing in the same strategy as you have to say, I'm only keeping it at this level? he could come a little deeper inside you and then you would go deeper inside him. So this whole game about using nuclear weapons in order to stop those kinds of transgressions uh, is a rather risky game to get into. And it's not going to be in India's interest to do that uh, because you are, you are sacrificing a lot more from your country for stopping those incursions. We should be able to find better ways of stopping those incursions through better sensing, intelligence, and uh, ability to build that infrastructure to be able to push them back there, rather than get into the game of use of nuclear weapons. Not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, even those who profess first use have gone through humiliating conventional defeats. <coughs> they haven't used their tactical weapons or their... So for all the talk, I think what you're saying is borne out in Bentley also. Yes. Apart from the, if you think it through about the details. Yes, the, the lady there wanted to ask a question. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Manpreet, for that excellent uh, exposition, as usual, always impressive. Just yes, introduce um, yourself for the record. Uh, uh, Professor Reshmi Kanzi, uh, uh, Nelson Mandela Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, Jamia Mulyaz Jamia. Uh, Manpi, two questions. Um, uh, being a, uh, I, I also consider myself still a student of the subject, so I teach arms control and disarm with uh, in my uh, university. Uh, it's a very gloomy picture. It's a, I, I'm sorry to say, but it's uh, given the challenges and the security concerns you, uh, uh, you know, uh, brought before us. Uh, it's a very gloomy situation. Uh, but then, what are the prospects for? Uh, arms control initiatives, because that is the only way out, as I see, that can, you know, bring about some kind of relief in this gloomy, uh, you know, situation that we are going through. So what are the, what do you think uh, are the prospects for future uh, arms control initiatives, uh, particularly uh, in this, you know, South Asian region, uh, given that we have three nuclear uh, powers, three, three nuclear uh, possessors uh, in this uh, region. My second question, again, being, uh, uh, you know, uh, and teaching arms control and disarmament, uh, do you see uh, any inherent contradiction in um, India's nuclear capability, which is required, of course, you know, given our security concerns? We need that, we cannot forego it. So given the need between our nuclear capability, the need for our nuclear, uh, uh, you know, the survivability factor, is there any in inherent contradiction between our nuclear capability and our perseverance towards nuclear disarmament? 
Thank you. Okay, great questions, both of them, Rishmi. So the first one about the future of arms control. I don't see the future of arms control of the kind that we saw in the past, even at the global level today. Uh, uh, you know, we are no longer in that situation of uh, bipolar world where there was a parity between those two countries, and therefore they could reach an understanding, particularly talking about ceilings on numbers. Uh, so that kind of arms control, I don't think is uh, going to be in the picture very soon. Uh, for the region, uh, the problem becomes that it will never be a bipolar thing. It will have to be bringing in the Chinese uh, whenever you want to talk about arms control in South Asia. So it becomes Southern Asia. And even then it becomes a strategic chain very quickly because the Chinese will never agree to anything unless the Americans uh, get to it. So, you know, we used to earlier talk about having some kind of a trilateral ABM treaty uh, between uh, the three countries here. Uh, which looks uh, more and more unfeasible because the uh, Chinese would never agree to anything like that unless the Americans were also brought in. So uh, it'll have to be more of the multilateral exercises at the global level, uh, not arms control uh, dealing only with numbers, but looking at more perhaps uh, things about, uh, you know, uh, all countries agreeing not to keep their arsenals at hair trigger alerts, uh, non-targeting of nuclear command and control, those kinds of measures that can be agreed at the multilateral level is perhaps the way that we could look at it. But given the kind of a political situation where we are such stressed interstate relations, uh, the whole picture of our arms control is rather gloomy right now. I don't think we are going to be uh, moving towards them in some time, at least not in the short term anyway, uh, to get there. Secondly, about uh, any dichotomy between India's position about disarmament and having the nuclear wherewithal. I don't think uh, there is that dichotomy uh, because what India's position has been that we want to get to a world which is without nuclear weapons, but they are a necessary evil. They are a compulsion because of the security environment that we have around us until we can get to a state where there will be universal, verifiable, uh, agreement on uh, eliminating nuclear weapons, uh, things are, I mean, we have to keep these weapons. So there is no dichotomy here. I think even after we went nuclear, uh, the fact that our doctrine starts with a desire for a nuclear weapons free world, it ends with that same desire, which is not anybody else's nuclear doctrine talking about the aspiration for a nuclear weapons free world. Uh, our, we have suggested that our heart is there. Uh, but unfortunately, till we can get everybody else to agree with it. And in today's times, as Sir mentioned in the beginning, uh, we seem to be heading more towards proliferation rather than, in fact, the, what has happened in the Russia-Ukraine conflict has drawn attention to nuclear weapons in a negative sense. Uh, and therefore, we might see more proliferation before the world gets to a picture where the risks are seen to be very high and therefore moving to elimination of nuclear weapons uh, becomes possible. So till then, keeping India's nuclear weapons, but uh, continuing to argue for a world because that's in our long-term interest, I think uh, there is no dichotomy there. We, we have to follow both the prongs for our own security, one short-term and the other long-term. I saw a hand right at the back. I work in a nuclear industry for the last four decades in the United States, uh, in California. And uh, my basic question is, if you talk quite a bit of uh, nuclear arms, what about nuclear strats of nuclear energy in India for uh, peace purposes, uh, like uh, fusion nuclear and fission nuclear? Can you, can you develop some light on uh, Status for energy production in India. So, sir, as you might be aware, India has a very large uh, uh, and elaborate nuclear energy program. This program goes back right uh, after independence, 1948, when the Atomic Energy Commission was set up, and we had our first research reactors up and running by 19, late 1950s, 1960s. At this moment, India has 22 operational nuclear reactors, uh, majority of them built with indigenous uh, technology. Uh, there is only the in the south, the Kudankulam nuclear power plants, uh, which have been built with Russian help. Uh, but the whole strategy for India is that nuclear energy is an important uh, aspect of its energy basket. 
uh, given the kind of vulnerabilities that we have with large scale uh, import dependence for our fossil fuels, as well as while we are moving in the renewable energy direction very quickly, as you understand, sir, uh, nuclear energy has the advantage of being a base load source of electricity. So till our storage technologies can get us to use the intermittency of renewables better, nuclear uh, will remain a mainstay. With the kind of climate change concerns that are coming up, uh, nuclear energy being a low carbon source becomes an important element of that energy strategy. India's requirement for electricity is humongous. Uh, and therefore, if we have to beat that through environmentally sustainable ways and by reducing dependence on outside uh, and therefore increasing our vulnerabilities, if we were to be dependent on outside sources of energy, the nuclear energy is a very important dimension. We are also working on the fusion technology as part of uh, ITER. Uh, India is uh, very much there on uh, building up that fusion reactor. Besides, of course, uh, India looks at its nuclear energy as a three-stage cycle, where in the final stage, we will be able to use the large-scale thorium reserves, which are available within the country and which will help us get to some kind of a, uh, adequacy on our energy front. Uh, I think we'll have to move on. I, think that's, I see too many hands, so I, I can't give it back to you. Uh, Ma'am, uh, you mentioned about deterrence uh, being a very credible strategy as far as nuclear warfare is concerned. And so you also uh, mentioned that uh, countries have nuclear weapons and yet they have never used it, right? Uh, even in very tempting circumstances. So the point is that is our focus on nuclear strategy really uh, a very kind of microcosmic uh, thinking? Uh, there is a, a larger dimension to uh, warfare uh, in international relations uh, where uh, things like financial sanctions are uh, can be very debilitated, right? They can be more effective than nuclear war. Uh, nobody is really talking about nuclear warfare as is uh, more as a joke, and, and uh, therefore uh, focusing entirely on this aspect for our veterans, for our uh, future uh, prosperity, like you said, prosperity of. So, isn't focus more on uh, let's say energy security for India? Uh, the eighty-five percent, uh, you know like oil imports uh, uh, or uh, the impact of uh, the Fed, uh, you know, just raising rates by 0.5%, uh, putting the uh, Indian currency in spiral over what we're seeing in Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, you know, many other uh, developing countries, right? So is there a wider dimension to be focusing on? Very much so, sir. I think you've got it right to say that nuclear deterrence and nuclear weapons is a very small part of your entire strategy of security. But since this talk was devoted to the nuclear challenges, the focus was essentially only on that, which is not to say the others are not important. As sir said, we just had a talk on energy security as part of this series. So all in the I'm past. Is, is it meaningful at all? It is meaningful, sir, because I remember reading, uh, you know, the article of the title of which was you can't go to a gunfight with a knife in your hand. So when you've got nuclear weapons in your neighborhood, you do need to have nuclear capability. But by, I ended by saying overspending on that nuclear capability is not worth the exercise. The Americans went up to 60,000, 70,000 nuclear weapons and realized that 1,500 is what they need for credible deterrence. So we don't need to make the same, same mistakes. Uh, you need that hardware, but you need only a certain amount of hardware. And the whole idea of this talk was to give that understanding that Nuclear is not the answer for our security concerns. It can only handle a spectrum of your security concern. And for that particular reason, your deterrence requirements don't have to go haywire. Thank you. Uh, we have a question online from Germany. Yeah, I thought we could just read it out so that they know that their question for Dr. Siti. It says, Dear Dr. Siti, you emphasize on deterrence as a. 
So sorry. Sorry. This is technology yeah. work. Yeah. I hope it doesn't happen to me. <laughs> uh, you emphasized on deterrence as political and military tool. In this context, do you foresee deepening of relationship between space and nuclear weapons program to build more robust and survivable nuclear deterrent force? So I refer to nuclear weapons as more a political tool than a military tool. But the paradox of nuclear deterrence is that it has to have a certain amount of military backing for it to have a credibility as a political tool. So the more you want deterrence to hold, the more you have to show that you have the military capability to handle deterrence breakdown, which is why your command and control structure is so important as a component of the credibility of your deterrence. Now, linking nuclear weapons to the space-based capabilities, as I mentioned, China uh, is improving the accuracy of its missiles with the kind of navigational aids uh, which are made available from the space-based capability. Sensing is what Sir mentioned. So your better ISR gives you the ability to do so-called military war fighting with nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, I maintain that it is more a political tool. You have to show the ability to use it for it to be politically credible, uh, but actually militarily using it is always going to be extremely problematic. And I would request each one of you try to put yourself in the shoes of uh, the prime minister who's going to take that call about using nuclear weapons, which would be that uh, scenario in which you think it would make for a credible use, and you will be better off by using the nuclear weapon than not using it. Thank you. Colonel Ashwin? I hope some questions come your way now. <laughs> I need to learn from you. Uh, my name is Colonel Ashwin Shan, and I'm a former cabinet officer. Uh, the question is on the moral dilemma. Uh, we have spoken about a conventional war if it happens in India and Pakistan. And supposedly, India makes a spectacular or a successful worry across the third desert that Pakistan's use of a tactical nuclear weapon on its own territory will it give it the borrowed right <coughs> globally vis a vis an Indian response to it? So, how do you handle those sort of moral dilemmas uh, in such a scenario? So if they were to use the nuclear weapon in their own territory, uh, I think, uh, and this scenario has been spoken about many times, sir, about their showing their uh, resolve by using it in their own capability, carrying out a test during a crisis which is taking place. I think India would just ignore it. I mean, uh, what does our doctrine say? It makes it very clear that if there was to be a strike on Indian territory or on Indian troops anywhere, then our doctrine comes into play about retaliation. Uh, firstly, I think uh, in all the understanding that we have about the red lines that Pakistanis have created for themselves, um, perhaps going into the desert, you can go a little deeper than you might be able to go say in Punjab where that red line will be much earlier. Uh, so therefore, uh, what I have been trying to advocate is your conventional uh, approach to warfare will have to factor in this uh, possibility of getting them to trigger their red lines. Uh, so we need to, I mean, I, I know that the military doesn't like this approach. Uh, they believe that if they have the capability, they should be able to use it. But it has to be used intelligently because you don't want to bring on a bigger problem on yourself uh, just because you have the capability. Even during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, it's not as if uh, President Kennedy could not have overrun uh, what was happening in Cuba or even caused grievous harm to uh, Russia, uh, Soviet Union. But the concern was that he was not willing to take the possibility of one loss of a city to the nuclear exchange. So therefore, uh, I don't think we should be so worried about if they were to do this and what would be the moral dilemma. Your deterrence doctrine is still suggesting if I am affected in terms of my territory or my troops, then there's going to be retaliation. And that retaliation is not going to be worth your while to have carried out something like this. So I think and making those signals again and again, making that clear is what we should be doing for enhancing uh, the credibility of our own deterrence. Thank you. I see a hand there. Yes, sir. Uh, I am Pradeep Gupta. I hope, sir, you will correct me. Uh, I do. Yeah. Uh, I have recently uh, set up a startup in EI as soon as uh, only the think tank a few months ago. I have a question about the use of AI, artificial intelligence, 
and uh, what we understand which is a force multiplier to build up better capabilities and china is quite ahead in this uh, ai uh, some in some areas they are much ahead in us also so uh, have we factored in that in as uh, means uh, drawing parity of the challenges vis-a-vis -vis pakistan and uh, maybe other this question to you sir as good you so happy uh, you know, I, I mean, we have the same problem of automaticity. We thought about this in the past. You remember, there used to be talk in the 60s of a doomsday machine that what do you do to guarantee a secure second strike <laughs> when you are not sure that you all your weapons are survivable? You then build automaticity into the system that once you are attacked automatically you will then retaliate even if there is nobody left in command or in control to actually press the button and there was for a long time in the 60s people in the us believed the strategic air command used to spread the story that the russians had already built it i don't know if you, if you remember the film dr strange love which was it's well worth seeing uh, but uh, and AI actually poses the same problem. Are you willing to delegate this to no matter how intelligent, whichever way it works? And I don't think any political leader worth his salt will actually hand over that decision. In fact, people don't even want that decision to be their own. There is only one country where that decision ultimately boils down to one person. Everywhere else, there's a dual key system. Whether in India, there's a civilian, there's a military component, there's a civilian involved at each stage of those decisions. And it's a ladder decision. It's not a decision that you need to automaticity. So I don't see AI changing that because ultimately, as she said, these are political weapons. These are not war fighting weapons. And you don't want it to become automatically a war fighting weapon just because the adversary has done something stupid. <coughs> And any political leadership worth its salt will keep that decision to itself. And it's an awesome responsibility when you think of it, of deciding to actually launch nuclear weapons. Uh, I think it could be done once by the US, but I don't think they actually quite realize what it would do. Uh, until 1956, by the way, they underestimated every nuclear test they likely knew. You remember Bravo? I mean, the, and it's only when they started testing uh, the thermonuclear weapons that they started getting accurate. Remember, this is before people could calculate properly. Today, you know what it's going to do. And that's why what she said about the consequences of a breakdown of deterrence and the need for us to re-educate a whole new generation. We as India did that in the 50s. Remember, we had the international conferences to tell people how dangerous consequence of the use of nuclear weapons work. And I don't see why we, we shouldn't be doing that again, as you said. So I'm not sure that AI, you know, poses a very different problem in the nuclear context from what we, I think, have already gone through and thought through in the past. You want to say anything? Only to add, sir, I was uh, part of a conference uh, uh, that uh, Carnegie had held in the US on the concept of uh, how artificial intelligence is going to intersect with nuclear deterrence. And uh, what I could hear from all the Americans who were there was how much they're struggling to keep AI out of nuclear command and control. Uh, that, you know, that there is this lobby which is trying to push for it uh, and how much uh, the nuclear command and control authorities don't want AI coming into the picture because it really makes things extremely difficult. And fortunately for us, I think we are still very far away from all of that. We do believe in having, uh, you know, several humans in the loop and not just uh, depending on any, any machine for uh, handling this issue. Uh, so I think we will stay in that direction. I hate to say this, but I think the time has come to thank Dr. Siti for what she's done this evening. That was really a remarkable presentation, talk, but also I think the interaction when you answered the questions that we raised. I at least am leaving this much more reassured than I came into this room because, you know, the thought of nuclear weapons is not a comfortable thought. And frankly, this confusion that she's clarified between the possible war fighting uses of nuclear weapons, 
this confusion between conventional war and nuclear weapons and their role. I think she's made it quite clear why we need to think differently, but we also need to understand the limited role that nuclear weapons can actually play and how political they are. They're not war fighting weapons, they're not just one more powerful weapon, a more powerful weapon than anything else we've had before. Uh, thank you also for what you told us about whether we need to change no first use and how we look at the world around us. Because, you know, there's a tendency, I think, that any new development, Pakistan announces tactical nuclear weapons. And as you said, Pakistan is interested in maintaining that instability. So it's in their interest to raise the shrill tone and to keep us on our toes, on the hop. Uh, but I think we need to keep looking at these things dispassionately. And you provided an example of how to do that, no matter what the question, whether it is tactical use of nuclear weapons by Pakistan on its own soil. You know, each of these contingencies, we need to think it through, think it through logically. And ultimately, never forget what Patton said. Your job is to make the other guy die for his country, not to die yourself for your country. And think the consequences through of what you're saying. Especially with nuclear weapons, because there's no going back once you actually use them. So thank you. Thank you. A really good evening. And for reassuring me, which I don't think people expect when they see nuclear in the name of the, in the title of the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before, before I give the floor to Commodore Bhaskar, I just wanted to thank each one of you from the bottom of my heart for being here today evening. Uh, and really, uh, no one has the, all the answers. The idea is to provoke your thoughts on this particular issue. Collective churning for India will find the right approach to nuclear weapons. Thank you so much. So thank you. Thank you. I'll just take a couple of minutes in this order. Thank the chair, Ambassador Shankar Menon, Shiv Shankar Menon. Thank the speaker, Dr. Manpreet Sethi. And of course, thank all of you, those who are here in person and those who have joined us virtually. I want to apologize to those who have sent in questions through the chat box and we could not have them responded to. But if you send me an email, you have our IDs, we'll make sure that Dr. Sethi could be requested to send you a response. I just want to take two minutes and make a special thanks to everyone here. Not a single phone rang. And I think that's quite remarkable. <laughs> we have been able to do the equivalent of cell phone vipassana, if I could put it that way. And really, I mean that very seriously. Thank you for doing that. The two points that Manpreet said, and I thought I'd just pick it up and flag it as you know, final thoughts, because we have a lot of young researchers here. I'm very glad that all of you have joined. We have the nuclear nerds, as I said, along with the other think tanks. And in her opening remarks, Manpreet drew attention to May 13th, 1998. And she also acknowledged the contribution of the late Mr. K. Subramanian, who are former director at the IDSA, as also a Commodore Jasjit Singh. Alas, both of them are not with us. And I think it's very appropriate that we remember them today. And I rec recall those two days very vividly. You know, Mr. Vajpayee as our Prime Minister, Mr. Prajesh Mishra, there were no cell phones and the IIC had become a kind of nodal point. And anecdotally, if I might share with you, I had become a kind of runner because I had a two-wheeler and that could navigate Delhi's traffic much better than other forms of transport. And there was some immediate communication that had to be sent to Mr. Prajesh Mishra. And one of them was to ensure that India's May 11th, May 13th was not described in certain, shall we say, terminology, the word Hindu bomb had come up and there was a lot of, I would say, emotive kind of association, which had inadvertently gone on to TV, Global TV was picking it up. And there was a need, I think, if I could put it mildly, to introduce some strategic communication kind of filters. And this had become, as I said, a node for that. And I'm so glad that uh, these issues have now been brought back and Ambassador Shankar Menon has also made this point. That when India tested on May 11th, May 13th, you know, we had claimed to be a different kind of nuclear weapon power. And there were a lot, many reasons that were advanced as to why India was different from the others and our commitment to disarmament. Even in the doctrine, if you remember, and I think Manpreet brought this point out, the centrality of India's commitment to disarmament 
for something that features there. And I say this with slight sense of regret that from where we were in terms of at least drawing global attention to some of the excesses and what the nuclear capability was all about, all about even after India was accorded exceptional status, if you remember in 2008, after the civilian nuclear deal, there was a sense that India would be different, that we were an exceptional power and we had certain orientation and certain values that we would advance. And I think somewhere that seems to have gone onto the back burner. And most recently, I think in the, the Ukraine war is not yet over, but in the first month, the second month, I think we saw a lot of what I would describe as intemperate references saying that this is the way we should also go. And I think Dr. Sethi drew attention to that. So the IIC has always been a place for encouraging, I would say, this kind of debate and discussion. And we as younger people at that time remember the animated discussions we had here. And I hope that our younger scholars would be able to pick the ball up and make sure that some of the many, I would say, valuable points that Dr. Sethi had brought onto the radar today about the consequences if deterrence fails. I think this is something that we should all ponder over. But on that note, again, let me thank Ambassador Shankar Menon, Dr. Sethi, and all of you, and our virtual audience. And if anybody wants, wants to write 700 words, please send it to us. It will go up on many websites, IIC, SPS, and maybe we can prevail upon the universities. But again, thank you very much, and I promise you 20 hundred. So I think we made it head for the bar if I were you. <laughs> On that note, thanks everyone. Bye bye. Thanks the whole technical team of IIC and the SPS. Thank you for enabling this. Thank you, Sushil and IIC and the program department. Thank you. Bye bye everyone. Good night. <laughs>